is Joy News Prime. Hello and welcome to Joy News Prime. And coming up in the next two hours, Food and Drugs Authority dismisses reports of presence of plastic rice on the Ghanaian market after conducting laboratory tests on samples received. Civil and local government staff association of Ghana threatened to embark on nationwide strike in two weeks if government fails to pay their interim premium. <coughs> Dorothy in Parliament reveals government is unable to upwardly adjust producer price of cocoa because the free fertilizer distribution program under former President Mahama was engulfed in wanton corruption. Why should the government consider paying bonuses again when the current price already has a component of bonuses, bonus amounts. And coming up in business on behalf of shareholders of ADB Bank organize emergency annual general meeting to make drastic changes to the bank's regulations and to restrict government's hold of the bank. Also in this bulletin, Parliament to have final say on whether or not the ex-Guantanamo Bay detainees will continue to stay in the country or not. The bulletin is also available on ABN television across Europe. Stay with us. Welcome again, I'm Marba Kumsen. In our first story, the Civil and Local Government Staff Association of Ghana, CLOCSAG, has threatened to embark on a nationwide strike in two weeks if government fails to pay their interim premiums. The association said government has failed to honor its obligation in a memorandum signed on August 18, 2016 with CLOCSAG for the payment of interim premiums. Earlier this week, leaders of Klogsag in the Eastern and Ashanti regions heavily criticized their leadership for failing to pile pressure on government to pay the premiums. Well, Public Relations Officer of Klogsag, Edmund Akwe, tells Joy News the association will be meeting on June 27 to take a final decision on the issue. So there are concerns by your members in the Ashanti and Eastern region that government has failed to pay their market premiums and they have threatened to embark on a strike next week if nothing is done. What would you say about that? Yes, um, somewhere last week we received press statements from the Ashanti and Eastern region uh, and their concern uh, was that um, the MOU that we signed with the government on the interim premium six, six months in, in the year, they've still not had anything from our side and from the side of government. Uh, what transpired uh, was that uh, come 2017 we were expecting that our uh, interim premium would be paid to us. That was the MOU that was signed. But we've not seen uh, daylight on that one. Uh, the national executives had uh, met the Minister for Employment, the Finance Minister and uh, other stakeholders who are involved in the implementation of the MOU. We are still uh, not uh, convinced that it's, being, it's going to be paid anytime soon. That is why some th the eastern and the western uh, Ashanti region are um, complaining, otherwise that's their concern. And uh, they are putting fire on as the national executives to also put fire on government. Because we believe that the MOU uh, as a memorandum of understanding must be fulfilled. Uh, as promised by the previous government. So what happens if um, government doesn't meet your demands? Well, um, the National Executive Council, which is uh, NEC, would be meeting next, come next Tuesday, 27th of uh, June. And um, they are the ones who can uh, give an authority or give a, a declaration if anything be it. But we're hoping that government have heard the concerns of our uh, regional executives and uh, we pray and hope that very soon, before the 27th, they will be able to contact the national executives so that uh, we will see the way forward, that we can also send uh, some kind of positive me uh, message to our members about the implementation of the interim premium. Should government attend to your cry for help? Would you st will the meeting still come on on the 27th of June? Well, the meeting will still come on because um, they have to come 
and listen if there is any positive news or there's negative news and they will send it down to the people, to the members at the, at the grassroots level. The final decision will be on the 27th of June. That is if government does or doesn't respond. Exactly. Uh, 27th of June, when NEC meets, will come out with a statement. We hope it will be a positive statement. We always hope for the better, so we hope it will be a positive statement. Well, former President Rawlings has admonished public servants to shun the negative attitude, such as lateness to work that they have come to be known for, describing the phenomenon as another form of corruption. The former president, who was speaking at a ceremony in Accra on Friday to mark Africa Public Service Day, warned the public service would continue to suffer if such negative traits are not done away with. Most public and civil servants in the country have become infamous for showing up to work late and failing to work diligently as expected. They have come under criticism by many, including ordinary Ghanaians, for contributing to the inefficient public sector. Former President Rawlings observed that corruption is not restricted only to misappropriation of funds, but failure to work diligently as well. He said... The public service cannot thrive if such traits are not dealt with. Refusing to commit ourselves to official duties is a corrupting influence that, has, that sets the tone for significant institutional losses. Your theme of nurturing a culture of professional and ethical values in the service should confront these very core values that many have relegated to the background so that we can restore the standards that your forebears bequeathed to you. There is no doubt that many of you are committed patriots who pursue a culture of professional and ethical values. However, there are others who uphold these uh, standards and drag the entire public sector in the mud. We all have a responsibility to confront uh, these negative traits and offer true meaning to the theme of your celebration. It is thus heartwarming that this auditorium is today being dedicated to the memory of one of the best public servants I've ever worked with, that's Mr. Nathan Kwal. Mr. Nathan Kwal was not just, was not a member of the PNDC or a minister in any of our governments, but he nevertheless served as a pillar of strength and quality during the time I worked with him. When Mr. Nathan Kwal was around on your side, then you knew truth was on your side. The former president also noted that public servants ought to be observant and take the initiative to address issues before they become too cumbersome to deal with. In the white man's country, in, amongst ourselves years ago, when the level of social responsibility was much higher, we didn't allow temperatures, pressures to build up to this extent. Somebody would be asking questions. Why is this happening? Why is this not happening? Et cetera, et cetera. But over here, when the situation becomes so corrupt and some of us are benefiting materially and others are suffering, I don't know whether but it ends up uh, looking as if we, we're, we have special oxygen masks and we can't smell the gas on the ground, how the extent to which, you know, the cost of living that people are suffering. In other words, our lifestyle in relation to authority, the law, justice, etc., is being denied to the extent, whether in our traditional ways or in the orthodox, uh, ch uh, what you call it, courthouses or the police station, people are feeling so deprived of justice that these things begin to pile up and pile up and pile up. Isn't it? And so with just that tiny little foul, whatever it was, it blows up. On his part, Deputy Chief of Staff Abu Jinapo noted public service as key in every government's machinery. Hence, every broken public service translates into a broken country. He challenged the public service to rise up to the challenge by working hard. This ambitious and well-articulated vision of the president is without doubt unattainable unless our respective civil servants, judges, auditors, 
educationists, statisticians, police officers, custom officers, and indeed, all public servants like my humble self rise up to the challenge. It will require hard work. It will require dedication. And above all, it will require an unyielding integrity and a fiduciary relationship with the state. Now, directors of the Marina Shopping Mall, the Koala Shopping Mall, and the Best Western Premier Hotel have been ordered to engage officers of the police CID for failure to register with the Data Commission. The Commission Friday embarked on an exercise with officers of the Ghana Police Service to arrest directors of companies who have failed to register with the Data Protection Commission in accordance with the Data Protection Act. Joint News' Joseph Akable was with the team and has come through with this report. We've been doing a lot of uh, uh, sensitization and uh, educating uh, personalities or companies or institutions who collect data from the general public to register. But unfortunately, we've observed that most of them have refused to register with the commission as required by the section 27 of the law. So now the section 56 also requires that anyone who fails to register can, it's an offense and should be put before court. So currently today, in collaboration with the Data Protection Commission, we have decided to embark on an exercise to uh, arrest and prosecute all who have failed to register. That was Chief Superintendent Dr. Gustav Yangsen briefing the press ahead of the exercise. It was to take officers from the CID to various organizations that had failed to comply with the Data Protection Act. The first part of call for the team led by officers from the Criminal Investigations Department of the Ghana Police Service was here at the Marina Mall. After entering and engaging the director for close to 20 minutes, uh, the team was informed that the office had just initiated the process of registration. They showed them a receipt of filling the online application form that requires them to make the payments to the agency within two weeks. The team then headed to the Koala Shopping Mall. At the Koala Shopping Mall, the situation was pretty much different as it was realized that their managing director had failed to initiate the process of registration, for which reason he was asked to show up at the office of the CID within 24 hours. At the Best Western Premier Hotel and the Kolebu Teaching Hospital, the trend didn't change. The CEO was handed a similar invitation after it was realized the hospital had failed to register. Executive assistant to the CEO of the hospital, Alaji Munir Alas, and explained why the hospital had delayed in registering. You realize that uh, there is a transitional arrangement going on. We have a new chief executive. The uh, uh, acting chief executive is handing over to a new chief executive. So the situation on the ground is not you know, the best for us to uh, be able to t tackle this uh, issue. But that, all other things notwithstanding, we've started the process of um, going through the registration exercise. When you... The commission intends to continue with a crackdown in the coming weeks. Both private and public companies are urged to register with the Data Protection Commission. You're welcome back. Now, the Food and Drugs Authority has denied claims that plastic rice is being imported onto the Ghanaian market. This comes on the back of reports, particularly on social media, of packaged rice suspected to have been produced from plastic materials and being sold on the Ghanaian market. But the FDA said samples it received from Ghanaians showed they were actually authentic and not plastic after laboratory investigations explaining how to identify identify real rice from plastic rice the head of food safety management at the fda maria lovelace johnson said there was no way plastic would not melt at boiling temperature uh, during cooking adding that uh, plastic cannot be molded at room temperature what you saw in the laboratory demonstrations are plastic pellets this comes into this country all the time and they are what is used to make the plastic products we have. Pellet, they always come into this country as pellets for different purposes. The rubber bags, that we, the carrier bags that we use, this is what is used for it. We, we got them to make this, to give you this demonstration so that you see the distinction between rice 
and plastics. The, the samples you see outside, you see that you have, I don't know whether you make the distinction that that is actually plastic that has been made li looking like rice. Now these are restaurant displays that are used in, the, in other countries. They are not sold here in this country, so you will not find them anywhere. That's why we are confident to tell you that there is nothing like plastic rice in this country. That is used as restaurant displays. And it is the way um, uh, things are molded for uh, football, rubber balls, uh, apples, uh, bananas, plastic bananas, and toys. All those kinds of things are made by companies that deal in plastic wares. They, are used, they use those things and produce them for restaurants you know, outside. We don't do that in Ghana because they are very expensive. If you see a small plate like that of plastic rice, it costs about 40, from $40 upwards. That is how expensive they are. So they are just for restaurant displays. They are not for eating. They are not plastics that you can chew. All right. So the, those plastic things, what we have, they are in the country. It's not that they are not in the country, but please don't call them plastic rice. It is not plastic rice. They are just pellets or raisins that are used in the manufacture. We have a lot of plastic uh, uh, manufacturing companies in this country. So that is how they import them. And that is what is used in molding plastic wares, like our buckets and our bowls and our plastic plates and all those things. That's the, the form in which it comes into the country. So how do you distinguish real rice from plastic rice? Well, the FDA says real rice will cook at a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius, whilst the alleged plastic rice remain as solid granules when cooked at 100 degrees Celsius, since plastics require a much higher temperature to melt. So why does cooked molded rice bounce when it hits on hard surfaces? The FDA explains. The physical and chemical properties of plastics are such that Ordinarily, they cannot be reconstituted into edible food. This is because plastics cannot absorb water and do not mix with water. The textural properties of rice varieties are due to the nature of their starch content. That is the ratio of amylose to amylopectin. I'm being a bit technical because that's the only way this can be explained. And these are the constituents of what we call starch in rice. Amylopectin is responsible for the sticky nature of rice. That is why you find some rice sticky. So in Thailand, we have something called sticky rice. And this quantity is affected by the different varieties and the different types of rice. This character of starch in rice enables cooked rice grains to come together or to stick or to agglomerate and allows it to be kneaded into a malleable sphere that can bounce off hard surfaces as is depicted in some of the videos that you see on social media. Amylose is responsible for the gelatinous nature of rice and therefore contributes to the bouncy properties of the rice when made into balls. The varieties of rice that contain a higher quantity of amylose will produce greater bounce, while those with higher amylopectin will bounce less. Well, the FDA has also indicated that it is it has arrested those involved in the coloring of oranges with unknown substances. A few weeks ago, video of a lady coloring the peeled oranges uh, took social media by storm, leaving consumers questioning how safe oranges are. But answering questions on Friday, the FDA says there is no more colored oranges on the market. We're doing the coloring of the orange. It is not allowed. Oranges don't have to be colored. Whether it was being colored with alum or the red of, with the red of uh, oranges and all that, it is not permitted. So we arrested them. The case is still pending. So we rest assured that now there are no oranges that are colored. And you can testify to that. Driving along the streets of Accra, you can see that all the oranges are now whitish and greenish. No more yellowish oranges. 
Let's do some more on food because the food mycologist is warning against the use of decaying plantain for the preparation of a popular local delicacy known as kakro. Professor George Teria Odanton of the Department of Plant and Environmental Biology of the University of Ghana maintains the decaying plantain is infected by a cancer-causing fungus, making it harmful for consumption. Adelaide Arthur has more. This looks apparently rotten. And the, same the revelation that an overripe plantain with peels turned dark and white substance forming around it is likely to cause cancer drew a reaction from the audience who had gathered to listen to the professor's inaugural lecture on plant disease, crop production, and food security. And this is what they use for preparing kragro. <laughs> Professor George Teria Odampton says, though the fungus is yet to be tested in such rotten plantain in Ghana, consumers must be aware that same fungus tested in South Africa causes cancer. This is a, a fusarium uh, verticelloides. It produces a toxin called fumonisin. They've worked on it extensively in South Africa by one Professor Marasmus, and it's known that it can induce cancer of the oesophagus. And because they drink a lot of uh, uh, fermented beer in Southern Africa, they do not recognize the presence of this fungus and they brew it and drink. And every year, more than 10% of the population begin to get symptoms of the, uh, uh, of the uh, esophageal cancer. And so we should be wary. We have not tested the food here yet to see whether it contains. But once the fungus is there, we need to be wary and be careful. So those who produce um, um, kakro with these plantains that have this particular fungus, we must be wary when we are going to buy the kakro and all that. What we can do is to bring quality control so that we will grade the plantain and we will reject that which is not wholesome. And we should have the boldness to do that. Other dangerous fungi affect several vegetables and fruits consumers enjoy. The most important is the uh, one we call Aspergillus flavors. It produces four different types of what we call aflatoxin, B1, B2, G1, and G2. The B1 is very dangerous and is found in food. And uh, whenever you see the fungus, you may think that it's harmless, but you may wipe it off, but the toxin is in the food. And this is what is causing a lot of uh, diseases of, of the kidney without our knowing. Secondly, it is an immunosuppressant. It suppresses your immune system. So you are not able to resist diseases. And we know that uh, children who have kwashiorkor and eat maize, which is infected with aflatoxin, is made worse because of the presence of aflatoxin. According to Professor Dampton, Ghanaian consumers are not safe unless a conscious effort is made to protect food crops through quality control. We ought to be vigilant. The Food and Drugs uh, uh, Board and the uh, Sanad uh, Authority, we went to the shops to sample for spices. And the things we found in them is alarming. We have aflatoxin in some of the products. And we have fumonisins and okra toxin in some of the products. Those which have been imported. And I think we need to do a complete overhaul of our shops. Go and sample and test for them so that we'll know where the problems are because people are getting sick here and there. We cannot really tell where it's coming from. He reckons if priority is given to food processing, packaging and value addition, government's one district one factory policy could be sustained and that will enhance Ghana's food and nutritional security. Hello, good evening. Thank you very much for joining me on Business Tonight. Now, shareholders of ADB Bank have made drastic changes to the company's regulations. Key amongst them is limiting government's hold on the company. They also voted to allow the reconstituted board of the bank to nominate and appoint the new managing director and chairman of the board of directors. These changes to the company's act were made at an extraordinary general meeting at the National Theatre in Accra today. Speaking to Joy Business after the meeting, Deputy Managing Director of investment firm Bellstar Capital, which holds majority shares in ADB Bank, Patrick Tinslina, 
said these changes were critical to put to help put the bank on a strong footing. It is only right that once an initial public offer has been effected and 450 shareholders approximately, I'm not sure about the total number, but minimum of 400 shareholders have come to add to it. The, share, the, the, the company's regulation must reflect that. In fact, there's more that we wanted to do, but we want to take our time and go through the regulations. But this one has to do with the governance of the company. And it's only important that those who've put so much money in it and have put their interest in the bank will have a say in the direction of the bank. It's good you said that there were more things that you wanted to do. One of them is to make these sweeping changes to maybe possibly propose a new MD. Um, that's, as we mentioned, it's the board that's going to do that. So I cannot tell you, you here. Do you have a majority hold on this board? We do have a majority or we will have a majority, but we'll wait till the board sits and the board is convened and then we can take it from so there. Is it more of a, doing more of a, call it a corporate coup, maybe some would say? Don't, um, I wouldn't say so. I think that we are going to sit down with government, as you saw from the regulation. We proposed that government will have three seats. So we are working with government. So we are not going to um, get up and say, oh, we are doing this, we are doing that. No, we will work with government every step of the way because we, are, we both have interests. So it's only, it's only meet and right that we do that. From the shareholding, you will be a majority shareholder in this company, all other things being equal. Are you going to make proposed changes in nominating a new MD to this bank? Uh, I cannot stand there and say that. We will discuss but will that. you table that at the it next It is not impossible. We are going to have to look at it. But you see, this is the whole reason why this exercise is happening. Because until today, and even until the annual general meeting, when the board is convened, we do not have any access to company. The, the company has not even signed their accounts. So you can't even tell whether losses are being made. So there's so much that this is, this is just to pave the way to give us as investors the latitude to work with government and make sure that we take this bank where it belongs. You're welcome back. Parliament will now have the final say on whether or not the ex-Guantanamo Bay detainees will continue to stay in the country. That's according to Deputy Information Minister Kujo Ponkuma. The Supreme Court declared the decision by the John Mahama administration to shelter the two here in Ghana unconstitutional because it lacked parliamentary approval and directed the executive to, within the next three months, either send the agreement to Parliament for ratification or send the two suspects back to where they came from. Here's the news desk report. Already, some members of the minority in Parliament are challenging the current administration to deport the two Gitmo detainees in keeping with the MPP's position last year when they were in opposition. Listen to MP for Bursa South, Dr. Clementa Park. Given that the current government then in opposition had a lot of issues about this, I would think that to live by what they, they said, they should send them where they came from. One thing is clear, the current president, Nane Kufado, while leader of the opposition NPP, had raised questions about the legality of the decision by former President Mahama to shelter the two detainees. This is candidate Kufado speaking last year on the matter. It is yet another case of the failure of leadership by the president of the republic and a sad example of his belief that he's answerable to no one, not even to the world of the republic. Like Section 35 of the Anti-Terrorism Act, Act 772, 762, which as president, he is sworn to uphold. Lawlessness at the highest levels of the state cannot produce good governments. For the plaintiff in the case, Nana Buache, a staunch member of the NPP himself and the current deputy head of the National Service Scheme, President Ekufado will be acting consistent with his previous position if he decides to seek parliamentary ratification. This is not a shift of any position. What we said was that, indeed, it lacked the needed ratification by parliament. The most important thing is that the decision then lacked the blessings of Article 75. So the thing is that the Supreme Court is seeking to remedy the situation. Top-level consultations are already underway within government on what to do with the detainees. Well, government says it is taking prompt steps to 
fully comply with the orders of the Supreme Court. As the House prepares to debate it, uh, Minority Leader Harina Idrisu has told Joy News the final decision will be made when the full facts of the case are disclosed. The new government has an option to send them back. It is not for you to debate that option. It is an option available to them as a government. I mean, if, if the Supreme Court says it's unlawful, so what is the lawfulness keeping them? What is the lawfulness? Please. The, the Supreme Court so, goes, goes forward to provide an alternative and provides a period within which them. this has to be done. So it means you have an option to send them away. So the previous administration must have, must have aired relying heavily on formal diplomatic letters exchanges, not conceiving it as a formal treaty agreement. But once the Supreme Court has made a pronouncement, we all should respect it as a country. But it doesn't lie within you to debate that an option available to government is to send them back. Let it come, as I listen, with the full facts and the justification. But like I said, there is more to it as part of our commitment to fight terrorism and relationship with the U.S. in global strategic efforts to fight uh, terrorism must have informed the government decision at the time. Let's stay in Parliament because the MPP majority says the current administration is unable to upwardly adjust producer price of cocoa because the free fertilizer distribution program under former President Mahama was engulfed in wanton corruption during the reign of former Cocoa Board CEO, Dr. Opuni. Addressing a news conference at Parliament Friday afternoon, the majority alleged that the distribution was schemed to benefit NDC party faithful and cronies. They also accused Samson Ahi of being complicit. According to the majority, the MP for Bwedi uh, was uh, one of those who, had, who supervised the politically engineered distribution program, which has adversely impacted operations of Cocoa Board. The Cocoa Fertilizer <coughs> Program, or high-tech program, we also wish to state for the records that Cocoa Fertilizer Distribution Program, otherwise known as Cocoa High-Tech Program, was introduced in 2004 and not by former President J.D. Mahama. Since the introduction of the program, a lot of successes have been chopped in terms of production output. Until 2014, fertilizers were being subsidized and farmers had to had easy access to the inputs. However, from the beginning of 2014-2015 crop season, the authoritarian chief executive of Cocoa Board, Dr. Stephen Opuni, decided to give out the fertilizer free of charge to farmers for application on their farms. Quantities purchased purchase were insufficient to meet the needs of all farmers due to budgetary constraint. Pressmen, distribution was based on cronism and political party affiliation. In fact, free fertilizer policy created, created enormous avenues for corruption. stay in the House because Majority Leader Seche Mensabuns has criticized members of both sides of the House for failing to prepare and present a report on proceedings when they embark on assignments sponsored by the House. The phenomenon, according to the Majority Leader, has robbed the House of institutional memory, forcing members to reinvent the wheel. Supporting the Majority Leader's admission, the Right Honorable Speaker of the House, Mike Okwe, warned members who fail to prepare reports upon return from a sponsored trip would be denied the opportunity for future travels. Speaker, the business committee finds it worthwhile to remind delegations that travel outside in the name of parliament upon their return 
to submit reports to the House. They are supposed to be capacity building um, for our workshops that members engage in, and upon their return, they are required to submit reports accordingly to the House. In order for other members who do not have the opportunity to have the experience of learning from colleagues. Unfortunately, and increasingly, the patients that go out in the name of the House come back and don't report on anything to the House, as if they are fanciful excursions. The Speaker, we are not going to encourage such endeavors any longer whatever the size of the delegation, and whether or not they travel with um, clerks, they would have to report to the House. To put the record straight, even if it's a one-person delegation, a local conference, a local meeting, or international, whatever, once you are sent by Parliament to go on any mission whatsoever, when you come back, as indeed the best practice is, you will have to report. Now, the pothole riddled Ablikuma Manhian Road was at the center of parliamentary uh, deliberations Friday afternoon when the Deputy Minister of Roads was called to answer questions on ongoing road projects across the country. The Deputy Minister, Kwabuna Owusu Eduomi, assured the government is in the process of paving uh, or paying outstanding debts to contractors to start new projects and finish stalled ones. The Speaker, the, 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 the people of my demonstrated because they said the road was in poor condition. So the DC organized the contractor to grade the gravel surface that has been in poor state because of the suspension of works by the contractor as a result of delay in paying the contractor. If you, have, if you as or indicated in my letter, the works have been done to the sub-base level. What is left is to put the base course and then tap. And these are the only works left. So yes, indeed, the contractor was asked to go back to site to grade and make the road more travel. That's what was done. Uh, as for payment, and as you are also aware, the consolidated fund is not in the hands of the Ministry of Roads and Highways. If it had been road fund, yes, but consolidated fund is not in the hands of the Ministry of Roads and Highways. So all the time, we have to be in consultation with the Ministry of Finance. Well, as I indicated, the Mahia Road is an ongoing project. The contractor has constructed the drains, if you have been there. The drains were constructed a long time ago. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The road drains have been constructed. And the contractor started with the earthworks, and it has reached the sub-base level. The sub-base level is a level that when you reach, you have only one layer, the base material to place, and then you tie. You're welcome back. Now, the leadership of the New Patriotic Party in the Ashanti region says it will investigate the circumstances that led to the chaos that characterized a delegates conference held by executives in the Subin constituency. Delegates to the conference on Friday were seen trading punches after some of them were denied entry into the venue for the event. MPP constituency chairman for Subin Yawamankwa described the conference as unconstitutional and illegal after he was allegedly prevented by some well-built men from entering the venue. The issue is, is constitutional. The sitting MP doesn't want the chairman to do what he is supposed to do. And instead of admitting that, he's shifting the blame onto the previous MP in the person of Honorable Azukose. He being the chairman, I felt, I felt that uh, nobody can stop me from joining the conference. So I decided to enter. And the way they harassed me, the way they pushed me here and there, 
until one police officer came to my aid before I was allowed to enter the conference hall. And even when I entered the conference hall, you can come and see where I've been asked to go and sit. I wasn't given a chair. I wasn't given a chair. And then uh, uh, my name hasn't even been mentioned in the program as it is going on. What will end this? In your own opinion, what will end this? Well, I'm looking up to the, the party hierarchy. I'm looking up to the party hierarchy. What do you want them to do exactly? Well, to me, I feel that this is an illegal conference. To me, that is going by the constitution. So what happened there is null and void? It should be. It should be. As I'm talking to you, uh, the, MP, the MP has taken me to court on the issue of the polling station album, contesting that the, the, the chairman of the Council of Elders who, content, who, who conducted the parliamentary election should not be. Two days ago, Nana Obri Boahin, National Deputy Secretary of the party, filed defense on my behalf. So, therefore, we are going to court. But the Constitution says that if you have any grievance, you have to pass through all the structures of the party before going to court. So I don't know what the party is going to say. I don't know what the party is going to say as to that issue. But then, if there is anything at all, I think it should be brought before, as you often do, discipline committee. Be taking me to the discipline committee more than seven times anyway. Welcome back. It's time for entertainment and IB is in the hot seat today. Miss G has taken a short break, but she'll be joining us uh, sometime next week. IB, hi. How are you doing? I'm good. And I understand that the internet has been buzzing with this uh, comment by Ivorian and musician Freddie, Freddie Mayway. Mayway. But tell us, yeah. how did it all start? Okay, it all started when she was on, when he was on Cosmo with Doreen and Doreen, Doreen Ags. Okay, so which are some of the Ghanaian musicians that you love? And then he started from Kodrenchi, uh, J.D. Blay, Ambuli, Amanzaba, yeah. and then he came down to the young generation. Then he yeah. said, oh, he likes Shatawale, mm -hmm. he likes uh, Stone Boy, mm -hmm. but the other one, he doesn't want to talk about it. It also starts with S. <laughs> so you know after what's funny? Mm -hmm. When people were listening, what, what, what I, I, I noticed on Facebook and social media, mm -hmm. um, people didn't need to know the full name. The they full just, name of the they could just, uh, they assumed they, who they, it was they, and they, they, were, quickly, right. Mm, they okay. were right. So after the interview, he was, um, he had a sit down interview with Ms. G. Ms. G. And then Ms. G asked, last two years when you were at Banquet Hall, for the um, for the honors, he said openly that he loves Sakode, and the only two Ghanaians he will really want to have a collaboration with are Sakode and Stone Boy. Right. So Miss G wanted to find out has it materialized, and the first thing is that well I don't need to let the, uh, say it right. Let's listen to what he said. He looked like Sakode me. Like you I'm older than him. Exactly. So I, I think he looked like him. He looks like him. Yeah, of course. Mm, I see. Of course. <laughs> but last year you were in Ghana. Uh, is it last year or two for the Legends uh, Awards? Um, and you came to Ghana to perform. Yeah. And I heard in an interview you said that uh, you wanted to perform or do a collaboration with Sarkodie. Yeah, and then you mentioned Stoneboy as well. Has that collaboration materialized? You made a mistake because I didn't want to talk about that because it's not good for him. It's not good for Sarko, dear. Of course. Why? He didn't have respect for me, and I don't, I don't want to talk about him because, um, you know, I told to everybody that I love him. And uh, for my new album, I decided to make a song with him. I sent the song. He has it today since one year and a half ago we were agree with everything everything every, every any day everything he has the sound 
and he, he didn't do any. Oh, boss, I send it to you tomorrow. I send you to 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 to, to you uh, in a, one week. I went to USA because my 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 wife gave birth, and I come back. I send it to you. Since the, this time, I don't still have it. The album came out. A year and a half ago, you sent and something on your the, track. The, 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 the track is Watch Me Body in the new album. I think now it's popular here. It's, uh, it's lucky. But if you want to, get to, to, you know, to keep the step, have to change, I think. Have to change, and this is an advice for all the 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 young people who want to make this job. You have to ha have respect for you, uh, for you, and for your people, for your fans, and for all of them who support you. It's very important to to stay popular. Mm. He didn't give you any excuse as to why you know he couldn't come do the song with you. I didn't have any any information or any uh, hmm? he didn't call me hmm. since this time mm -hmm. well, I, I, i'm christian mm -hmm. i can forgive mm -hmm. i can forgive but if he comes apologizing and asking about i have to tell to about, about it, it to leave it in my heart if he you comes know, apologizing and say that he wants to do a song with you again would you would you allow him <laughs> watching during the same time next week I'm Arbo Kumsi for me and the rest of the team have a lovely weekend this is joy news prime